tonight we've got a bit of numerology, symbology, astrology, archaeology. It's a bit more, as I said, of an esoteric talk. We've had a few hard-working <laughs> Bilderberg type, 9-11 type talks. So this is a bit more on the energy side. A lot of us are getting into this, changing lives, changing energy, synchronicities. So as I said, uh, Bruce Fedden has wrote about it for quite a few years, done a lot of talks and really good ones on YouTube from spiritual awakening, but mostly on 2012. So it's an interesting subject. Please show the respect to you. Try not to ask any questions. We'll have a break in 45 minutes. Still get some chocolate and beetroot cake. And as I said, we'll come back after a 20-minute break and give another hour for you. So enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. That's, it's always great to see so many people actually interested in these kind of slightly uh, unusual subjects. Um, although, of course, they're becoming a bit more usual. I mean, um, I think most people know now that you actually start to meet more people that are at least slightly open minded to um, you know, perhaps the idea that there's this new world order happening uh, and also that there is something relating to this period of change that we talk about 2012 as a general men, but uh, the idea that we are. A, a transitional point for our civilization, um, clearly economically, politically, you know, things are definitely going a bit nutty. Um, I've been looking at this subject for probably about 22, about five years. I've been involved with esoteric and occult subjects for about 15 years. So that really, in a way, I'd say I'm actually a supernatural researcher who has fallen into research in 2012. So. Um, I will be looking at 2012 first today, and then in the second half today, we will move into the more uh, spiritual, esoteric side. So, what I hope we can do is at the end of the first half, is any questions, I will try and answer them, and then we'll go on to the, the, the good, weird stuff. So, um, just uh, that, that's what the Mayan pyramid at Palenque in Mexico. For those of you that are not familiar with the Maya, the people that give us this 2012 date, um, the calendar system that they have ends. Or should I say, culminates the 21st December 2012. This is the long count calendar. The Maya have actually got 21 different calendars, uh, so you might have mind-bogglingly complicated the system actually is. Uh, the ones that we're actually concerned with in, in my own research are the Zolkin, which is a 260-day count calendar, the the Harb, which is the 365, to some degree we're interested in, and of course the long count, which is an enormously long period. You've got 5,126 years in each one of its subsections, and five of these sections is equivalent to what we term the great year or the platonic year of roughly between 25 and 26,000 years. There's, there, there is a, a debate as to whether the great year is actually 24,000 or close to 26,000, which I'll, I will go on to later. Uh, just, just for your interest, I have you that the, the actual date, 21st, 12, 2012, actually can be written as 13-0-0-0-0 and uh, is known as Four Ahau Free Kankin. The, the long count of is, is represented as a five place notation system. So this has been ticking up through the 12, up through each one of these zeros would go up to uh, like 12 then to zero basically. So it's counting up to 13. The, the long count represents a, the, um, a breakdown of the kins, which is days, the weenals, which are 20 day months, Tons, which are 360 days. Uh, so yeah, so sorry. So you've got these uh, the 20 day months, the tons, which are 360 days long, and then catons, which are 20 tons, and then the bactons, which are the 20 catons in length. And this is for the 13 bacton calendar, is another name for the long count. Uh, that's fairly boring technical stuff, but it's just so you're aware that's how it works. You can always look online if you want to actually uh, go into the various. <coughs> breakdowns of the calendar that I think you probably won't want to unless you're very technically minded. Okay, just for uh, just for your interest, just so you get an idea of what actually happens on the 21st 12, 2012. Here you have what we call the uh, the galactic equator. So when you look at the night sky, of course you can see the Milky Way, the river in the sky as the Egyptians termed it, uh, going across obviously the um, uh, well, from horizon to horizon. And what, what actually will happen is the sun will rise along the ecliptic through roughly what we consider to be the centre of the Milky Way. Now this is a phenomenon that happens every December within this period of 36 years. So it's not just on the 21st, 2012, 
and in fact in 1998 it's actually closer but um, 2012 falls within a, a window of time in which you will see the solstice sun in December rise approximately into the galactic centre. Uh, it's, it's a slightly vague idea and as you hear this term probably some of you would have heard of the galactic alignment it's a, it's a very vague alignment, it's not really an alignment as such, you know, technically it's actually a conjunction, it's also, it's only from our point of view, as in people on the Earth, if you were to be on the Moon looking at this, you would see there's no actual physical alignment in the terms of you think of the planets in a row. This is it's literally to do with the, 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 where the Sun appears to rise in the sky from our perspective. But this is what we will call this sort of the galactic cross that will form on the 21st of December 2012. Um, so we're essentially looking in the direction of the galactic center. Why is that important? Well, the Mayans believe that Exobolba Bay, the birthplace of Asia, and the place where the dead go lies in that area. So we suspect there was something important there. Just got, what I've got today is a few clips, but I'll just, I'll just introduce the ideas first. Um, the Maya themselves are, you know, alive today. There's often people say online that, you know, if the Maya was so clever, why were they all killed off? You know, where, you know, where are they now? But there, there's millions of Maya people still alive today. They still have oral prophecies, records of their beliefs of what will happen in 2012. And they are now starting to become more vocal, uh, which is about time. I know that I attended a conference in Mexico uh, a couple of years ago now. And it was amazing to be actually in Mexico and find that there was no Mayan speakers at the events at all. And in fact, the only Mayan people that I saw were serving our drinks at the conference. So, so I thought it was a real, sort of real shame, really, because you're, you're there in their heartland and, you know, they're basically the skibbies, whilst, you know, all the Western speakers were talking about their wisdom, which was quite ironic. But, um, so what, what I have today is a couple of clips for you that will actually be showing what the Maya was saying. There's, um, uh, a clip from one of my friends, who's just, she's just on the way back from Mexico, she's made a documentary interviewing uh, the, the Maya elders, Maya people, and she's put this together to kind of uh, give them a voice, which I think is about time. I mean, there is another, another film coming out soon, I hope, um, called The Shift of the Ages. I mean, some of you may have seen it floating around on Facebook it's for the last two, three years as a team to make another film uh, that's trying to give voice to the Mayans. But, they just lack the funds to do it. So, so far, most of the 2012 information has come from a Western perspective, particularly an American perspective. Um, so, I will just quickly put this clip on, and then we'll move on to the next section about the calendars. But um, this is just an intro to the film. The film itself will be released in December. So, you, you might not have heard of it as yet. So, uh, hopefully, you will enjoy this. <laughs> Es el inicio del renacer de la vida y las esperanzas de este gran pueblo. Yeah, I'm saying. 
Y eso pues para nosotros es una agresión a nuestra vida. Y es una agresión a toda la humanidad entera. Vivimos un genocidio tremendo que se quedó en la impunidad. My website, it will appear on there as soon as it's out. Let me go back to the area. Okay, just yeah, for those who aren't aware, back in about I think it's 1998, there was a, a large meeting of the tribes of North, Central, and South America. Uh, and in this, they brought together their prophecies. Obviously, the Maya brought together their prophecies with uh, those such as the Hopi, who were considered the they're brothers, pretty much, but they are considered to be the, the Hopi are the keepers of the wisdom of the, the ancient stories, the prophecies, whereas the Maya are considered to be the keeper of time, calendars, astrology. Um, amongst them also were a number of the jungle tribes who have their own interrelated prophecies. The interesting thing is that they all have overlaps when it comes to this 2012 subject. Um, there is a general agreement within their um, sort of uh, interweaving communication.
education network that we are in the time when the indigenous people are finally going to be listened to because we're going to realise that we in the so-called developed world have gone down a really dark path which is going to cause us a heck of a lot of pain unless we start listening to those that have stayed in communion with the, the plant spirits, the animal spirits, you know, the planet itself. Uh, some of the prophecies do sort of make it very clear that it's a, a time where we have to choose. It's, it's not a case of that um, you know, the aliens are just going to blow us up or that you know, it's going to be some sort of outside force where you know, Jesus actually fixes everything. Uh, it's consciousness itself, and this is in their, you know, their vision of it, is that we get to choose what happens next. They, they do say there's the potential for extreme pain, extreme turmoil, if that's what we want. You know, um, Though I don't go as far as saying that they say there's a doomsday, I haven't seen any of the minds actually say that we, we will destroy the world. I think, to be honest, the world has been here for billions of years and it will be here for billions of years more, whatever we do with ourselves. Uh, if we want to go into the darkness, you know, that is our choice. <laughs> I'm sure the earth will carry on. Um, but they do tell us that we will have to make this choice and quickly because we will see things like the crash. This, bear in mind, this is back in 98. Is that we will see the crash of the economy. We will, we will see the birds fall from the sky and the fish turn belly up. And if anyone's kept an eye on the web, they'll see that huge flocks of birds have just died flying around across America and Canada. Uh, there were the whole massive groups of millions of fish have turned belly up in, in the sea, just with no explanation for why. Uh, some of these animals are turning up with strange injuries, burns, you know, internal organs melted, and really odd things happening with the animals. The tribes down in the jungles are saying the same thing, that birds are falling from the sky, and particularly the birds that fly the highest, uh, as though something is happening to them. Perhaps our own toxins going up to them. But these prophecies are happening. And they said that when they, they knew that when they saw these, they would have to come out and say to us that we need to wake up, that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the 11th hour, um, and that if people don't start to cut back on the way that they are harvesting you know, the earth, all this kind of new fracking and this deep mining and poisoning the rivers and that you know there will be dire consequences. And it's not as simple as saying that you know that the earth itself will somehow turn on us. I think as the minds in, in that film make it clear, they see it, we will destroy ourselves, we will kill ourselves. It, it doesn't need an outside agency. And I think we're doing a very good job of it at the moment. Uh, amongst the other prophecies that they relate, there is also you know there's positivity too and there's in the we have the potential to turn things around. It's not, it's not too late to minimise the damage. I mean, there's, it's pretty clear that, you know, if you turn on the news, you can see that, you know, painful times are already here. So I'm not going to sort of sugarcoat it and say that, you know, that it's not going to be difficult. I mean, it's, you know, anyone who looks into this kind of, um, the broad picture of the Illuminati, New World Order, you know, the ongoing fake wars, the poison in our food, the poison in our water, the poison in our air, you know, the magnetic interferences, you know, they, we are being bombarded, you know, it's become a prison planet, uh, there's, there's no sort of, um, there's, no, there's no getting around that it's going to be hard, you know, we, we've allowed it to get a long way down the wrong road, uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, we should then feel that we just give up, it just means it's more of a challenge, and I think, you know, I'm sure the sort of people that come to these talks, like a challenge, you know, you're really here challenging yourselves, uh, listen to the various speakers that come here, and hopefully um, you know, open your minds to new subjects. So obviously this is the kind of thing we need, is people looking at new directions, looking at new possibilities. Uh, it's in that way that I think that we are going to turn things around. The Maya prophecies also include to do with the crystal skulls. I'm not sure if anyone's too familiar with those, but they also predict that if we are on the right path, there is help available to us, such as the crystal skulls, that they can come back together, the 13 legendary crystal skulls, which are seen as a repository of immense knowledge beyond our wildest comprehension, which um, contains within it pretty much all the information we would need to bring about such things as free energy, space travel, uh, all of these things have been kept for us by the ancients. However, the Maya hid these when the Spanish invaded and said they will not come back together until we grow up, we wake up, and are ready for that kind of knowledge. Otherwise, all we'll do with it is make things worse. Uh, the same can be said of um, some of what's turning up in Egypt. Certainly, one of my so co-researchers, uh, Richard Gabriel, which was able to look at his work from the Giza project, um, they, are, they are basically right on the edge of discovery, well, revealing to the world uh, an immense hidden repository of technological knowledge which has been left again to help us at this time, which can do a lot to reverse the climate change problem that we're seeing. 
and this too can be brought out to the world. So there, there are these immense, you know, potential helpful artifacts left to us from a precursor civilization. Uh, whether or not you go as far as saying that that was an alien precursor civilization is, you know, your own, you know, your own choice. You look at the data, but to be honest, it doesn't matter whether they were advanced humans or whether or not there were aliens back then, as some of the native people tell us. Uh, I don't mind. What I mind is that the fact that there is the potential there to use a technology which can help us. Uh, this combined with the spiritual awakening could significantly reduce the, the painful aspect of this transition. So there is good reason to be hopeful and good reason to be positive. I don't sit around trembling in my house at night thinking it's the end of the world, 2012, we're all going to die. Otherwise I wouldn't even look at this subject. I say wouldn't bother doing talks because I would just, you know, I suppose sit there and wait to die. You know, so. <laughs> The, the Maya calendars themselves, I'm just going to put another brief thing. I know, for the first section talk, I just want to do a few clips just to get the technical side of the, the 2012 uh, debate sort of across to you, whereas the second half, I'll be a bit off the cuff, because as I say, I'm more of a too much research and I, I can talk off the cuff with that. But I think that the Maya calendars are fairly technical, so I'll just put a, a quick clip just so you can see how they interlock. <coughs> So hopefully that gives you a bit more of a visual representation of what the calendar is that I'm looking at. Um, the date is back to 3514 BC, beginning of this part of the Maya system, but I don't believe that it is the start of the Long Count, it's the start of one era of the Long Count. I mean, there's good reason to suspect that the Long Count goes back to precursor civilizations. Again, it seems to be a hand-me-down from the Olmec who preceded the Maya in Central America. The old men themselves were a very mysterious ancient culture who seem to have had links to Africa by the looks of things. I mean, anyone who's seen the, the great old men heads will, will notice that they seem to be much more African looking than they seem to be indigenous American looking. Um, there's certainly plenty of evidence to say that the Central America and the South America have been visited for, well, hundreds, thousands of years by seafaring cultures. They 
it's only a, it's a kind of a Western bias, this idea that somehow Columbus discovered the Americas and all this kind of money. But we know that Egyptians, Romans, Celts, all sorts of people have been to the Americas. Um, there's no reason to suspect that even back in these times of the old Mexican and precursor civilizations to America, they weren't trading with abroad, they weren't getting information from other cultures. Uh, the Aztecs, for instance, say that they originate from Aztlan, which we have obviously um, many researchers have linked with Atlantis, uh, lost, they say, a lost island culture. So again, there's plenty of indigenous knowledge suggesting that these cultures came, at least some of the information came from outside, if not the people themselves. Uh, this calendar seems to me to have been a hand-me-down. The, the, the parts of it which they, they got from the Omec is the Zolkin, the 260 day, which is a spiritual calendar system. I mean, everyone in this room will have a Zolkin birth date, where you would, if you, you could go on this website, um, Diagnosis 2012, uh, Jeff Stray's website, which if you go on to there, you'll find there's a, a calendar converter. So if you're interested to know your my birth date, um, do go on there and have a look. Because I, mean, I certainly found for myself that it was incredibly accurate. I mean, I, I'm a nine wind, um, and that is someone who will work with uh, transferring and communicating spiritual information, information the esoteric um, by any by means of writing or by means of speaking, uh, which you know I've been doing for years now, absolutely through the web. Um, I didn't know that, you know, when I got involved with my account, I was already doing this and found that uh, you know all of the information on there for for my sign for nine wind was accurate. And I know that having done with a few other friends, and they often find that it's incredibly accurate for you. So do take a look at that. You'll find that with this, there are, as I've mentioned on here, sort of 13 tones, as we call it, meshing with 20 glyphs, and the two together will give you the representation of what you basically have been born to do. I mean, the Maya so believed that this calendar system was important that they would actually name their children after the day sign that they were born under, because they thought it was so crucial to why you were here. Um, so I'd certainly say, you know, that that is, uh, that's the calendar that's the most spiritual, if you like. Whereas the, the long count obviously deals with something different. You know, the long count is dealing with some abstract idea that there are these ages which are to be monitored and be aware of, that at the end of each age there would be a transition. I and mean, they say there's already been uh, at least three, four different ages which have ended by various means of fire, wind, water, you know, events like you know, tsunamis, storms, you know, the natural disasters basically have come and cleanse the earth at the end of each of these 5,126 year periods. Uh, there is, I mean, I've looked at, I have looked at that myself, and I think it's, it's difficult to prove that, that they're right. So if you go back to 5,126 years ago, you do find that there was an upswelling of a, you know, a new consciousness within humanity. That if you look around the world, you can see the rise of, sort of civilizations in Sumeria and the rise of China and you know, other, other great nations that seem to be coming into their sort of heyday. Uh, around that time. So we can say that there is some truth in the last era. When you go back further, we simply just struggle to get enough evidence to say precisely that every 5,026 years that there was a new era. Uh, but so, so to a degree, take that with a, a degree of scepticism, but certainly if you relate it to the last period, then yeah, there does seem to be tangible evidence of these, these cycles. And partly, when you look at if a civilization was actually destroyed, in a world-changing event, it is hard to kind of definitively find the evidence for them. And we know that researchers like Graham Hancock and others who have done very well at piecing together the, the, the lost wisdom of some of these cultures, and certainly do know that there were the precursor civilizations. And if you look at the, say, the temples of you know, Baalbek, and at least, or if you go to, obviously, the pyramids and the Sphinx, which itself seems to be going back to at least sort of 10,000 years old, if you look at the water weathering on the Sphinx, uh, also, you go to Tiwanaku, a city which is 12,000 years old, built with incredible, huge stones. The Indians themselves there say, we have no idea who built these. These were ancient when we got here. Uh, you know, this is a, a completely precursor civilization to the local people with incredible knowledge of astronomy and astrology. Um, so we, we do have evidence for these precursors, but we don't know what ended their reigns. Uh, but certainly, we would have to imagine something pretty hardcore, because I mean, these were an uh, advanced culture that are doing things that we today really would struggle with. I mean, in many cases, you'll find that we just can't replicate what they were doing. I mean, um, I think there's examples where you'll find there's 
30 ton or 100 ton blocks that have been you know, taken up mountains and then slotted together so closely that you can't put a razor blade between them. You know, there's uh, evidence of types of concrete that are harder than concrete we use today. You know, you've got um, stones moved across deserts, which would just, if you were dragging them, would just dig into the sand. You know, they, we don't give these people credence of cranes. You know, with the Egyptians, we don't even give them any more than copper tools, and yet they cut granite blocks and then they drill through granite. You know, all they had was copper tools. I mean, I'd love to see a modern contractor turn up on a building site with his copper tools and start cutting my granite blocks. I'll, I'll, I'll pay him triple if he can do that. You know, I want to see it happen. Uh, so that's like getting a knife made out of butter and trying to cut through a piece of steel with it. So, you know, it's incredulous what we are told to believe. Of course, you, know, you, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't realised that, you know, that the mainstream view is incredulous most of the time. So we're just told to swallow this nonsense. Um, but certainly, uh, we are in a period where we are getting the evidence again that, you know, that certainly that at least this last era of 526 years has matched up to what the Maya have said. There's a beginning where we see consciousness upswell. There's this kind of culmination where we see the challenges come in, the collapse of the economy, the environmental problems, the climate change. So in this respect, the Maya predictions and prophecies are accurate. That's why I'm an argument credence. I would have, if I didn't think they were matching up, I, I would have personally abandoned this research long ago. Right, I'm just going to move on to the galactic alignment. So I was going to go too far down the rabbit hole. But the galactic alignment obviously is a key part of this um, this discussion. For those of you familiar with John Major Jenkins' work, he's the books on the galactic alignment. He's pretty much the world authority on it. But, when he says alignment, it's, it's a bit misleading because, as I said earlier, really it's a, it's a galactic conjunction and it's rather vague. It's not in the way that people think of as planets lined up. In fact, I've seen people saying that 2012 there'll be an alignment of planets. I mean, for a start, that's, that's just nonsense. There, there's no evidence for that. So, you know, we know there's been a yod, which is an astrological uh, configuration, rather like a sort of a Y shape. Um, we've got the Sun, Jupiter, the Earth, which is, you know, it's interesting to a degree, but it's certainly not, you know, an alignment of all the planets. That's fantasy. There's another one, I'll just clarify, we'll go on to the video, just a few fallacies that I should get out of the way, which is the idea that we are crossing the galactic plane, which I'm sure some of you would have heard of. In fact, it, it's been banded around as almost that that is the crux of it, that we are, basically, there's a, if you look, imagine through the centre of there's a plane, there's this line. We, our system, our soul system, moves up and down like this around the galactic centre. Too many people are saying that what's going to happen is we will pass into the centre of the plane of the galaxy in 2012 and thus will come into effect of the super black hole in the middle of our galaxy. And that this is the whole idea of 2012. And that's, that's wrong. The fact is we're millions of years above the galactic plane. So that, that is an untrue. If you ever encounter that, just know that that's just fantasy again. What we actually have is a much more subtle astrological kind of effect that you know it's, a, it's a, a time marker there's no physical reason that we would know of in that respect that there would be anything, anything happening in 2012 it's not that you're aligning to black holes or passing through asteroid belts it, it's nothing so tangible as that we, we are dealing with something of a spiritual marker where they say that they line this up with this particular time where the sun rises approximately towards the galactic center and the winter solstice which is itself symbolic, the winter solstice again relates to ideas of a transition through towards the night, the death, you know, is a, um, even in our own traditions, the Celtic pages, you know, the winter solstice was the time of dying of the sun, the rebirth period. So I don't think it's happenstance that this 21st December 2012 date happens to be a winter solstice date as well. It also happens to be that the actual moment of the, uh, the equinox then is going to be, or sorry, the solstice, is going to be actually 11-11, which um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. Also a lot of um, talk about 11-11 coincidences online, right, that I have myself. You, know, you, just, you notice it's 11, 11 on the clock all the time, or you, 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 know, you happen to be flicking a magazine or book and it's 11-11 somewhere in it. But there's a lot of people having this up, and this again ties up with 2012 because you've got this 11-11 number. So these are all more intangible things that are going on. Um, there's certainly, again, there's no to say that there's a planet X coming in 2012. I mean, that's another one that gets bounded around, that Nirabu's coming back in, and planet X. And I used to be uh, an administrator for a planet X forecast, who, I don't know if it Marshall Masters' website, he's, he's read a few doom fear based books on the subject, which um, I'm not particularly happy with, you know, so I, 
I, I don't see this as being real. I think you know if we have a planet incoming that was going to be in our skies visible by 2012. You'd be able to see it with a telescope, basically. You know, there's I know that we we know there are conspiracies, but the amount of people now that have access to a telescope, you know, is incredible. Uh, the amount of different universities and all the rest of it. If you actually had a large body like a planet incoming this close at this point, it, it would be reported. And I don't believe that they have that kind of conspiracy where even individuals in their gardens are stopped somehow from reporting it. So these these are the fallacies. Um, there's a short clip here which will sort of goes into what it actually is, what it isn't. So I'll just quickly pop that on for you. Yeah, this just deals with a few of the misconceptions I mentioned, but um, also might be helpful just to see it. I mean, they say the Mayans used the term galactic alignment, but the Mayans didn't use the term galactic alignment. So, you know, not speaking Mayan myself, I don't know what they would call it. Again, the centre of the galaxy is a vague idea as well. We've got to remember as well, it's an enormous galaxy. So what we're seeing is that it's kind of an optical effect when you look up and say that that's approximately the centre. And it takes a, you know, even the best mathematicians in the world, like you can't get a precise centre. It's, you know, it's a very vague idea. criticism of the um, some of the people that are trying to play off as though we're talking about astronomy where we're talking about astrology which I think is an important point to keep in mind that although there are aspects of general interest in astronomy uh, they are often glazed over with inaccurate information so the other the other concept that we have to sort of get eyes around with this is precession the equinox, which um, basically is the phenomenon that gives us the, the passing through the, the bands of stars which make up the astrological houses. So obviously we're moving towards this age of Aquarius in the sky. Uh, there's the current view, which most of you would have learned at some point, is that basically the Earth has a wobble. So if you imagine it as a ball that's been spinning and it's developed this slight wobble as it spins. So you, I don't know if you, <laughs> did learn in some point of schools. Uh, it gives us this idea that as the, if you imagine the North Pole of the Earth basically wobbling around like that, so of course 
the stars above it in the sky change over time. And this is this is given to us as how this sort of 26,000 year platonic year happens, that we will slowly move through the houses of the zodiac as this occurs. And this is the sort of mainstream view for why we have the procession effect, which seems to be uh, tied into this great cycle of the Mayas. I tell you, it is awfully close. If you have five of their cycles against the platonic year, it is, it's close enough to make you think that they were dealing with the same ideas, the same concepts. Uh, there is, however, a school of thought that um, disagrees. I mean, I won't ask about the video, I'll just explain what's happening. But basically, there's um, an altered model, because there's a number of problems with this existing paradigm. Like, for example, that I, mean, I don't know if you're aware, but we use a couple of different years. We have a tropical year and a sidereal year, and these, these two years don't mesh. But they are required to make the current universal view work. So you have this funny idea that we have these, these two different years that are going on. You know, which are, I think it's significant 20, 20 hours apart, something, but you know, there's, there's something, you know, there's something's not right with it because you shouldn't have to do this. And the other problem with it is if you imagine if the if the world really is wobbling like this, there should be a, a fairly constant rate of climate change going on for that part of the planet because it will wobble towards the sun and away from the sun. We don't see that happen. We, we look across the historical record and that doesn't happen. So why is that then? You know, if the world really is physically wobbling, then there should be an effect on our climate from that. Um, also, this this used to be two years. So if I said there's there's got to be another mechanism. This loony solar model where the moon somehow its gravity is pulling pulling on the Earth, causing this wobble. You know, it's just being accepted as that you know, this must be true because you know that's what we've always worked with. If we don't work with it, it's going to ruin a lot of our ideas about how our solar system works. Instead of looking for a more logical cause, they just keep putting bolt-ons to this model and just carry it on, despite the data that is going against it. What works much better is if we are actually in a binary star system. Uh, if, you look, if you look now into astronomy, you'll find that the vast majority of stars in the universe that have been discovered are in binary or trinary systems. Uh, so for us to be in a solar sun solar system would be extremely unusual and extremely unlikely. Uh, what we actually also find is that if you put in a second star that is in a long period orbit with us, then you actually find that this makes sense of precession. Because if, if you just imagine yourself, if basically you've got our star, uh, it's, it's wandering in a circle. Well, it kind of quick for your you go, You've got a star there, star there, they kind of go around each other. As they're getting closer, they speed up. So you've got these two stars doing this kind of cosmic dance, basically. Um, so if you, if you think we're actually moving through space relative to this other object, so of course, if you're looking at that, and we're going in this kind of elliptoid sort of shape, yeah, of course, yeah, the stars are going to change, much in the same way that the precession, give, the, the current version of precession gives us. So it works, you know, the binary model works, but not only does it work, it's historically recorded. You go back into the, the ancient texts, the Vedas, and stuff, you know, they, they say this is what was happening, that there is this binary twin. Uh, it also explains why we have this, this strange peculiarity of the, the lengths of the year, where, where they're not explained well now, because what you'll find is, of course, if, if we are moving through space, there is a drag on, this, on our solar system. The planets themselves are also experiencing this drag, because the sun is moving, the planets are trying to circle it, and they're having to catch up, because the sun's actually moving away. The same goes again with the, with the moon. The moon has these strange periods of having a 28-day cycle for, uh, and also a 31-day cycle for, if you're looking at its cycle around the Earth, varying with its, um, the cycle of the phases, you know, obviously going to full moon, to dark moon, you'll find that there's this, again, there's this period between of a couple of days extra, which shouldn't really be there. But of course, if we're all moving, the moon's trying to catch up as well. So it's adding on this lag. So we're seeing this actually, the reality out there is much more suggestive of this second sun which is talked about in the ancient texts. Um, there's, a, there's a great work done by um, Walter Cruttenden, the Binary Research Institute, which I'd recommend. He's gone into great depth with this. He's also, you know, he's looked through the ancient texts. He's found all, you know, the many references to this, this second star. He has also been that it seems that it is actually the star Sirius, which may seem a bit of a, a leap logic, because it's obviously, it's not the closest star. Uh, however, we do also know that that is one of the most important stars in mysticism. If you look into pretty much any mystic system, you will find that the star Sirius crops up again and again. 
or references to the dog, the dog star, um, and then she was Isis, who is Sirius. Isis obviously was extremely important. She was represented as a goddess. Uh, different names in pretty much every culture that you look at, you'll find a reference to a god who's contemporary to Isis. Um, Sirius is Isis, basically. You've got you a hint there, even in the name, sorry. But um, this other star is now coming back in towards us. This has an effect, an energetic effect on our sun. And one of the reasons why we know it's coming back towards us is because if you look at the historical record, Sirius used to be red. It used to actually be red, and then it changed to blue. Now, this is historical. You can see, go back to records of the Romans, that they had their, their great astronomers record seeing this red Sirius. And then at some point, it changes blue. Now, the only way you can do that is if it's switching from moving away from us, having redshift on it, to actually coming back in towards us. And it's gone back to a blue star. Now, the blue star obviously crops up in you know, other prophecies as well, in the, the hope of the blue star. And this blue star it starts to come back in, and at this point, we start moving into a new era, an era of a transition towards a more positive um, civilization. That is the, the prophecies that are given to us, that basically, that they'll go through a shift, there'll be a transition as this star comes closer to our sun, and the, the, the nearer they get to each other, the faster they come to each other, and the faster we elevate towards the new golden age. Um, it, it takes a long time, not to say that you know, you're know you going to suddenly see this sun in the sun, with Sirius is a long way away, it's a subtle effect, but it's a real effect in terms of the historical record. They say that when this changes, we start to go through a transition and we start to notice that people wake up, there's a greater spiritual realisation, and um, the, the faster this happens, the more it happens. At this point, we are, um, you know, we are still a long way off from it being coming to its closest to point perihelion, but uh, it, it, certainly the, the tangible effects of it seem to be happening already. The blue star then can also be looked at in another way, which I, I find quite interesting, because I, I don't like to pin down and say, definitively, the blue star is definitely serious. I mean, the Hopi prophecy of the blue star, which talks to me that there will be, uh, it's a final prophecy of the Hopi, that basically, that so far, the string of their prophecies have happened, come true. Uh, they said that their last great prophecy is that there will be a dwelling place in the heavens that will fall. Um, some people speculated as to whether or not this will be the, you know, the current space station that we have up there. May or may not be. I mean, it's certainly interesting that they are currently abandoning the space station. I don't know if people are aware of that, but NASA says they're going to bring the people back because of these uh, yeah, the accidents that happened with the, the Russian um, ship that was being used to ferry equipment. They said that if we can't rely on the Russian ships to get people up and back, and we're not using these you know, these the shuttlecraft anymore, it's putting into an awkward position where they're going to have to temporarily abandon the, the space station. Now, the space station is pretty old. Does require constant upkeep. Without people on board the space station, there is a realistic chance that it will go false, and then once it goes false, it, it will fall back to Earth and then burn up as a blue star. So this has been given as one possibility, certainly of the of the idea of a house falling from the heavens. But the the Hopi people themselves, their word for um, the, blue, the blue star, basically the Kachina, is also a word for Sirius. So it's hard to pin these prophecies down. They may have multi-level meanings. Uh, there's also Another, another part to the blue star, which I find particularly compelling, which is this idea of a galactic superwave, which I don't know if anyone's looked at galactic superwave theories, but that essentially that we know now that the cores of galaxies sometimes explode outwards, but they, they emit huge amounts of cosmic rays, cosmic energy, in a, usually in a twin burst from, from the poles. So you have these sudden bursts, which will then radiate out, out into sort of, you know, about Six months ago, they detected that, you know, there's evidence to show that our galaxy has had these happen. They found that there's two enormous columns of, of gamma radiation coming out from both the poles, and they had to um, basically have to pretty much sort of apologise to the theorists that have talked about super waves and say that, you know, Christ, you know, this is the evidence for them. So we know that these core emissions not only happen in other galaxies, they've been happening here. One of the things you, well, one of the things we can't tell, though, is whether or not, if there had been a, say, a galactic um, core explosion in the Milky Way uh, thousands of years ago, it could be on its way to us, but we won't know because it's still traveling to big light. We won't see the core explosion until it gets here. So at the current moment, there could be one, there could be two of these core explosions already racing out towards us, but the light from them just hasn't reached us yet. 
when it does, there is every chance that we will see it as a blue star in the sky, and it would be bright. We would see a bright blue new star in the sky. And this could last for decades, hundreds of years, possibly even millennia, with this whole new star there. Uh, this is a particularly tempting idea to go with because we know also that these cosmic rays would actually have an effect on us. They would have an effect on a mutagenic effect, particularly on unborn children in the womb. You could see a whole leap forward in our evolution. Um, the, the work that's been done on previous uh, issues from galactic cause proteins in our Milky Way, the contemporary research has come from a few of the more fringe researchers, suggests that when you look back around about sort of 13,000 years ago, it does seem as though there may well have been one of these. That there is this talk of uh, another star, a bright star in the sky, a sudden mutation of several species, a die off of some species. Uh, we also see at that period evidence for uh, changes in this precursor civilization. As I mentioned, there's Tiaraco 12,000 years ago, uh, which seems to be abandoned. There's, um, there's other sort of underwater structures off the coast of Honda, Japan, which go back to around 12,000 years ago. So if they're correct, and well, sorry, I should add as well, there's more evidence for than that. There's also there's dust particles found in ice cores which seem to be pushed into our solar system around that 12,000 years ago, which again, as these energy waves come in, they tend to push in dust, cosmic dust. And we've seen an enormous buildup of cosmic dust coming in in the last couple of years. Again, also seen changes in our sun. We've seen changes in the, the types of radiation coming out. There's been um, a really weird effect, which is that if you look at the atomic decay rates of certain isotopes, which are supposed to be absolutely constant, they found fluctuations in them. And they said, well, this, well, how could this be? You know, this, this, we rely on these atomic decays for um, you know, our clocks, for the atomic clocks. Uh, one of the things they, they then realized was that not only were these fluctuating, but they were fluctuating specifically in a relation to sunspot activity. That there seemed to be this impossible relationship between actual atomic decay of isotopes and when the sun's going to have an, an eruption. So there's something really odd going on. That there's no particle that they know of that should be able to cause this effect. So unless the sun is producing some new altered particle, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, I haven't the, got much wrap up into the digital issue, I think, important part of this. Um, do, do, do. Oh, I suppose the only thing I've got to know is DMT. DMT is one of, my, one of my personal pet theories, basically, is that there's a chance as well that when this cosmic energy comes in, when these particles come in, that they will affect us very directly. We all have, in our, in our brains, we have a pituitary gland, a pineal gland, which in there is a, an element called magnetite. Magnetite is sensitive to magnetic fields. Uh, it, it relates to our dreaming, it relates to out-of-body experiences. We know it has great effects in terms of people with unusual sort of um, psychosis making like psychosis is very sensitive to this, can have all kinds of visions and whatnot related to the magnetic field activity. If these, if these magnetic waves and these other waves come in and are picked up within the brain, within the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, there is a chance that they will spark the sudden overflow of the creation of dimethyltryptamines within the brain. Uh, this is a, DMT is naturally occur within most life on the planet. Can we do that with uh, magnets? Sorry? <laughs> can we do that with magnets? Well, actually, yeah, I mean, just straight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, you can actually attach a magnet to your forehead, but you, you have to get it the right way around. I can't remember which way, it's either north or south. But if you go the wrong way around, it can make you ill. But if you do it the right way around, <laughs> Can actually have a ship. Then a guy did. He did it for three nights. I think he slept for three nights. And what he found was over that period, he started to see this 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 bloke sort of standing by a tree in his room. It was really faint, like a ghost. But over the three days, the bloke got more and more solid. And then so the bloke saw him and got scared. So he, he seemed to be shifting into this guy's reality. So yeah, you, you can do it directly with magnets. Um, so <laughs> so he's. I don't, don't try it at home, try it at home. <laughs> tell, tell me up to you. But, yeah, I mean, DMT, I don't know who has tried DMT or similar hallucinogens. I mean, if we do get this cascade effect where the brain basically picks up on these rays, these magnetic fields as they shift, and does give us a, a massive DMT dose, that would certainly change the world overnight. Because I mean, I, I, <laughs> it, it, not necessarily for everyone, but because I don't want to be on an aeroplane when it happened, but I mean, uh, yeah, that, that's a genuine possibility. It's one of my favourite possibilities is this 
DMT, some cascade, everyone gets a wake up event, you know, their own. <laughs> uh, well, I hope they're ready for it, because it'll be mayhem. Yeah. But I'll have a break there anyway, and then I'll go to the more esoteric stuff, so hopefully you can stick with me. Thanks, Tony. I gather, obviously, that most, most people here, obviously, uh, are quite aware of um, a lot of the subjects to do with energy, with conspiracies, and all the rest of that. You're obviously a very well informed group, so hopefully, I mean, I can skip through really quickly through these slides and just kind of. <laughs> Basic. Oh, uh, sorry, my friend pointed out earlier, I should have actually said who I was. Uh, so, <laughs> basically, I, I'm Bruce Fenton. I, I, I run a website called 2012rising.com, which, uh, so anyone's actually interested in finding a bit more, if you go onto my website, you'll find an archive there, which has got articles going back over the last three years. There's also some um, interviews I've done on the radio, on my radio, and some videos and stuff on there. So yeah, if you're interested, have a look on there. But basically, that's kind of why I'm here. They didn't just sort of find me while they were around last night. But yeah, I should have put that out at the beginning, because uh, that is that's the usual way to introduce myself from the beginning. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, doo -doo -doo. Right, so I think pro probably many of you are going to be fairly familiar with this first line anyway, which is obviously just a, a very basic representation of the, the human energy system in respect of the main centers, as we call the chakras. Um, I'd point if you haven't worked with energy and meditation and the rest of you, you probably at least have heard of chakras because, I mean, to be fair, they, you know, they, they crop up even in mainstream media and whatnot. Um, just a very basic, for those anyone who doesn't know, of course, I mean, there's, although, although the, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Indians, the Mayans, loads of other civilizations have talked about this, this energy system that runs through us, there, there are loads of different energy points, you've got in your hands, you've got on your joints, there's, the main seven, basically, are the ones that are depicted here, which is the, we call the root chakra. Uh, the, the colours, obviously, are relate to the type of um, frequency vibration of that energy. So you obviously have the red for the root chakra, orange for your sacrum chakra, uh, yellow for the solar plexus chakra, see the green for the heart chakra, blue in your throat chakra, uh, the indigo for the third eye chakra, and then uh, violet for the, the highest, the Sahasrara. The chakra. Um, so, although these other, other energy systems, you know, these other chakras all over your body, these are the ones that typically, if you're working in meditation, people tend to focus on. Um, also, for healing purposes, if, if anyone has just your energy healing, often you know you may well tend to focus more on blockages in those chakra areas. And I, I mean, I, I'm a Reiki healer myself. And I know that I find it particularly helpful to to work specifically with those seven chakras. I and mean, I. Myself, I would put a crystal on each one that corresponds to the energy vibration of each chakra, and that would amplify the Reiki energy. So, um, basically, uh, the reason I want to speak so is just because we're going to do a, bit, a little bit of a meditation just before I do the remote view experiment. So, I was just going to sort of say, for anyone who's not aware of these chakras, they, they're used for meditation. If you basically, if you drop yourself into a sort of a relaxed meditation state, which uh, I quite like, what is called Vipassana meditation, which is focusing on the breath, essentially if you breathe in and out through your nose, there'll be a point where you'll feel the air, it could be on your lip, it could be on the inside of your nose, just focus on that feeling, and um, once you sort of drop into a, you know, an altered state or a relaxed state, you, you may well detect um, feelings of tightness in these chakra areas, and if you do feel that, then if you bring your attention particularly to that area, it can help unblock an energy flow for you. So that, that's the reason why I wanted to quickly bring up the, the fairly well known chakra system for you. So I won't, I won't go into a big lecture on that, but skip on to the next one. But just yet, yeah, if you don't know it, basically just bear in mind those points. Um, there was actually, sorry, there was one other, there was one other point I wanted to raise as well, which is that for anyone who thinks that, um, you know, the Western uh, sort of scholars and the medical folk don't know about this, and they, you know, although they would sort of, sort of pretend that they don't, it's quite obvious they do, because um, what you'll find also is well that we have, in, in medical terminology, you, you have a triangular bone at the base of your spine, which is called the sacrum, and that is Latin for sacred, and this is where the Kundalini energy resides, which is the, the Holy Mother, this, um, the spiritual energy of the human being, which resides sort of coiled up at the base of your spine, essentially, is depicted as a serpent-like energy. Uh, so funnily enough, our medical system, not knowing about any of this, calls that bone the sacrum, the sacred bone. So, and then at the top there, you're from the crown of your head, where 
the energy bursts out. It's described as it bursts out in a fountain-like uh, way. And funnily enough, what do we find at the top of our heads? We find the fontanelle, which is translated as the little fountain. So, of course, our, our medical system knows nothing of this. Um, right, so moving on to... Um, I think we all know the medical system are trustworthy folk looking after our best interests. Right. as well on the nature of the universe. Um, currently we have a, a view which I don't really agree with basically that we have this um, a system based on that physical matter is the all important and that it's controlled basically by, uh, well we look at the universe essentially the force that's most interesting to mainstream science usually is gravity despite the fact it's an enormously weak force. Um, whereas a more recent model is the electric universe theory which I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Uh, basically, you, you see in our space structures that look far less like they are being shaped by this weak force of gravity and far more like they are being shaped by electrical forces. I mean, this is just one example. Um, you're not actually seeing these being coalesced into a, a singular object uh, circling around a, a higher gravity core. You're, you see these spectacular shapes out there which look more like they've been generated from electric flows corresponding with each other. Um, also, you see plastic uh, flows where you'll find the structures. I mean, go through any sort of astronomy books, or you'll find these sort of interweaving, spiraling effects in nebulas and stuff, which look like DNA and whatnot. Which, again, plasma energy flows in this method. If you look at a plasma ball, you'll see that quite the, the, the filaments of energy interweave with each other. They coil around and reach the sides because it's a, a way that electric energy finds itself able to transmit the distance. It's easier. So, we actually see physical evidence that electrical energy is extremely important in the formation of large objects in our universe. Um, one, of, one of the things that um, I find particularly interesting is this fact about the, the what's put here is the common sun, which I mean, we have this classic model that the sun is the source of our heat, you know, and it's the source of our, source of our light, our energy. Uh, I'm not going to totally argue this, because of course, you know, from a day-to-day -day perspective, yeah, that, that's right, and obviously we look up, the sun's there, the heat's coming down, light's coming down, all the rest of it. But what's missing from that model is um, one blinding flaw is that when you, if you actually measure the temperature coming from the sun, I mean, there's an observable anomaly, which is that if you go to the actual surface of the sun, you'll find the temperatures there are far, far cooler than in the atmosphere of the sun, above the surface. It goes up to millions of degrees more. Now, if you look at conventional models, we know that convection currents don't work like that. They, we should see heat coming out from the centre of the sun, radiating outwards and becoming colder. Now, it should not go the other way. So if the sun truly is a nuclear furnace with nuclear fusion happening at the core, then we should see these convection of heat outwards. We don't see that. Uh, one of the reasons why this should be, in my opinion, is because we're living in an electric universe. The energy for the sun is not coming from its core. The energy is coming from outside. It is coming in and coalescing around the sun, the sun is also a step down and transform of this energy, and it then goes on to us. This makes sense of it, to cause then the outside area of the sun would be hotter because the energy is reaching it first. Um, the other part of this which shows this is most likely to be correct, if you look at a sunspot, which are cool spots on the sun, you find that these are also places you look deepest into the sun. I'm sure you've all seen the classical images of the dark spots on the sun, and the photos looking inwards. And what you notice is they're black, they're dark, we're looking into a dark core. Now, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense in a nuclear furnace model because it should not be super cold inside the sun. You know, that is not how nuclear reactions work. Um, so to be honest, I, I think that, that model is, is dead, it's gone. It's, it's being clung to by people that just won't admit that their careers really need to be redirected and that they need to lose their jobs or find a new way of doing things. Because what they carry on doing now is bolting on things like dark matter and black holes and you know all these other just wishful thinking. Really, if you look, you look at it properly. I mean, first of all, we have these we have black holes that suck in everything. They suck in light. They suck in everything. Yeah. But when 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 it was convenient, they said, "Oh, well, actually, some black holes must be emitting it again because otherwise our theory doesn't work." Well, yeah, that's nice that you think that might happen, but it doesn't make any sense. Because how can they be infinitely massive, sucking in everything, 
But when it's convenient, they have to admit matter. You know, so it just bolts on. Again, they have this problem with the um, what they call neutron stars, which are supposedly we needed to find a star that could spin at basically thousands of times a minute, which is which just doesn't seem possible. We're talking about enormous bodies. If they span at the kind of speeds we need to find to explain energy transfers in the galaxy, suns that will just tear apart. So, well, how can we get around this problem that certain suns are, there's certain areas of space are emitting energy in these pulses, these pulses of light and energy coming out of these terrific speeds? Well, we, we, there must be another kind of star out there. So, they decided the only one that could do this would be a star made out of condensed neutrinos. So, they said that if, we, if there was one of these, these could spin at this colossal speed. But again, this goes against a fundamental law in physics, which is if you pack together the neutrons, they will just fly apart. So but ignore that because we need it to prop up the current model. So we just say they exist. Uh, you know, see, so it's just, it's just, you know, so they keep doing it, they keep bolting on stuff, but it's just fundamentally flaws in this system. The old model is this death. So really, we live in an electric universe. And anyone who um, wants to look more into that, if you Google thunderbolts of the gods, you can look into the electric universe model, see a much better in depth explanation. Also, I'm just giving you a very brief overview. But, uh, I mean, even from you know, a sense point of view, we know that we are you know, electrical beings, we have electrical fields around us, we live on a planet that is uh, you know, greatly interrupted by electrical forces, we are surrounded by electrical fields, magnetic fields, you know, they have a huge impact on us. Whereas gravity, as I mentioned, is a, a probably weak force, which you know, even the greatest minds think is probably just an after effect of some other force that we don't quite understand. Um, also, the electric universe theory, one thing I think it's worth just quickly going on to as well, if we skip over, is this idea that uh, once upon a time, in the ancient days, the people said they saw a dragon in the sky, they saw some kind of great body, this serpent, the great serpent, the destroyer, this perturber of worlds, uh, it crops up, this, you know, Sumerians, Egyptians, accounts, uh, there's all sorts of names given to it, you know, this, the, the frightener, this, the destroyer, uh, and basically, Venus seems to be a pretty good match for this. It seems that in the work of people like Velikovsky's um, investigation of the election, early investigation of the electric universe theory is that what we see is that um, Venus may well be from outside of our solar system. And one of the, the, the best uh, pointers towards that is the fact that, for example, Venus spins in the opposite direction to all the other planets, which is very peculiar. Because if we're saying that these all, all form from the same spinning dust cloud, they're all spinning the same way. They all form the same way. How did Venus suddenly turn around and start spinning the other way? The other, the other fact is that Venus still has a residual tail, which was detected. It also has filaments of energy coming out of it, which is like plasmic phenomena. So it seems that at some point, Venus came into our system as an electric, uh, electrically charged body. And as it came through, it perturbed other planets and had a great interaction with us, caused all these, these legends of fires from the sky and rains of fire and these electrical thunderbolts of the god where the gods went to war with each other and were firing thunderbolts at each other. Um, and Venus, of course, crops up again as you know, one of the most important goddesses. Um, you know, as Isis again. So, um, another legend. There's lots of legends, basically. If you look into it, you'll find lots of legends about Venus at some point having been this sort of you know, a different kind of body to what we see now. Um, also, comets themselves are seen you know, similar. They have electrical charges as they travel around through the universe and through the galaxy. They also pick up charges. We, we've seen that this is true when we recently impacted a copper uh, satellite into a comet to do some experiments with it. What they found is as the, the satellites came in, there was actually an outburst of energy, which actually so he reacted to this copper transition with the electrical energy, so exploded out light. But it shouldn't have happened if it was just an icy body in the, uh, you know, the conventional model. Uh, Earth, the magnetic fields on Earth, uh, I, you know, probably most people are aware that there's been some significant changes, we're seeing a kind of a, a shift of our fields at the moment, that the fields are wandering at a faster and faster speed. This is the, the north-south sort of magnetic fields of the Earth, the, the, base of the, the magnetic poles are moving faster. There's also a weakening of the fields, we're also seeing holes appearing in the fields. There's some sort of electrical um, shifts going on, magnetic shifts going on, which again suggests that something is a cascading effect from outside of our world is occurring at this time. Um, which I find particularly interesting. I mean, we literally are in a peculiar situation where our, our shields, if you like, of our planet 
are in a very vulnerable period where they're weaker, they've got holes in them, the sun and the earth have gone into a particular polarity alignment, which again weakens the protection we have from outside forces. Um, so there's some, there is some cascading effect going on, which again, I'm based on what I believe about the central universe, is out there in the galactic centre, some kind of energy is radiating in, radiates to the sun, radiates onto the earth, the earth's field then cascades onto us. So we are literally having an electrical effect that is flowing in, probably from a universal centre, you know, I don't think it's just galactic, that there's a, an energetic effect that cascades down through all what we call mass, you know, bodies and whatnot in the solar system. So these, these, these are ways that we can observe the changes within the flux of the electric universe. So just skip on some, move on to the next bit. But, um, again, yeah, I so, say, you know, do, do have a look at fun bolts of the gods. <coughs> and uh, quantum reality, I think most people here are going to be familiar with, you know, some elements of quantum theory. I think it's, it's kind of unavoidable that you start looking into alternative subjects. At some point, you're going to have someone talking about quantum physics, you know, to some degree. I'm, I'm sure other speakers, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure speakers have been here talking about quantum effects, and quantum reality. And, um, but anyway, I mean, I'll very briefly just go over some very basics, just for anyone who, who's not too familiar with it. Um, the, so this is, a, this is an example of one of the classic experiments that showed, you know, that the universe doesn't work in the way that uh, many physicists thought it did when they originally started studying mass. Uh, basically, you have here the, the, the twin slit experiment, which is that if you fire particles through a slit, you get this, you know, what we expect to happen, basically, you get a single point on the wall there. If you, if you get, you know, firing at both slits, you'll get a couple of, of these lines forming where the particles are hitting against the wall. Uh, if you fire, uh, instead of firing particles, if you fire waves of energy at these slits, you get these interference patterns where the waves cascade off each other and you end up them cancelling out. So then there will only be these, these five lines at the end here. So this is a, a classical experiment of quantum physics that shows um, the difference between solid things, i.e. particles, and in solid things, i.e. waves. What we found in quantum physics was that if you were shooting the basic particles at the slit and you were just not monitoring this for instance, you just came back to it afterwards, you would find that where the particles were being just fired at it, they would actually go through both slots. A single particle would actually go through both slots at the same time. And you ended up having wave interference patterns where you should have these, these lines of particles hitting the wall. So what it seemed that what would happen is the particles would turn into waves as long as we weren't looking at them. Put a camera there or any sort of observing material there, or you know, even aware of what was happening, they would remain as particles instead of turning into the waves. So we have this wave-particle duality, which basically is that you know at any point the the particle is both a particle and a wave until it is observed. So this is the classic observer effect and how the observer affects reality, a basic fundamental level of our reality. Uh, I, I, I can say that it's a fairly key bit for anyone to get, you know, and obviously if you yourself explaining to friends and whatnot, you know, these kind of subjects, if you get them just to look at the this this basic experiment, you know, I think it's one of those ones that gets people's heads around the idea that we don't live in just this fixed, solid reality where, you know, oh, it's just a table's a table, you know, it's hard, mate, you know, and it's, you know, yeah, okay, that's how we experience it, because we are observers, other people are observing, so things are in fixed states here, because, you know, he's got awareness of observing, but we know that when you look at the experiments at the fundamental level, that it's not like that, that, you know, we're making it solid. Uh, that in reality, there is pure potential that the particle is not only a wave, it, it's a wave, it's, it's a particle, it's both, it's neither, it's in one slot, it's in the other, you know, it's only when we look at it, and then it just goes back to just being a particle. So it's, you know, it really is, um, it's mind bending the first time anyone looks at it, and I know that myself, you know, it's sort of, you, you just don't, it's not logical, but once you get your head around it, of course, you realise what it means. It means that, you know, the universe is basically pure potential interacting with consciousness and then the consciousness can help shape what the universe becomes. It's sort of from that ground level working up. Uh, it gives people more of an idea that we are interactive with our reality. It's, it's not it's just all out there, oh, what can I do about it? You know, it, it, it's not like that. We do an awful lot about it. Uh, also we have things like bilocation or spooky action at a distance where uh, single particles 
well, it's a single. A particle in one place can have seemingly affect the particle on the other side of the galaxy. You know, if there's a change in this one, we'll see the same change at the same moment in the other one. So there was speculation: is this some kind of faster than light communication, which breaks fundamental laws? Um, and what we actually realise now is that actually it's probably not that. It's probably that it's the same particle in two places at the same time, literally the same object in the same place at the same time. At the same time. So um, this is what we call sort of spooky action at a distance. Um, that you know things that don't seem to be related are related. It's, I mean, I, I find an easy model if you sort of to explain to someone is if you've got like um, just like a, a fork, like if you put a fork on a desk and then you you move that fork. If you were looking at it from a, a just from a two-dimensional plane, what you would see as a two-dimensional being would be basically four points for problems when they touch the table, two points for the hand when they touch the table. From the higher dimension, the third dimension, as you move that fork, you see all these different points would move. So a two-dimensional bit would be like, oh, these, these, these six objects, they all move together. You know, what they don't see is it's the same object, because they're, they're looking at it from a lower dimensional view. From our third dimensional view, we know it's a single object. And we know that it moved because we moved it. So the same applies to higher dimensions. So as you go up into, say, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, whatever dimensions, uh, things may well be interconnected, maybe the same things. I mean, even things becomes a very meaningless word, but um, yeah, this, this is a, you know, a reality. We know that this is actually happening detectable in experiments, that uh, objects are connected in some bizarre way, or even are the same objects for distances. Um, recently, actually, I was at a talk over in Sweden where um, the chap Anthony Peake, I don't know, I'm sure some people have been through, uh, helped expand on um, something I wasn't interested in, which is the way in which the brain works, which I, there was some of it I got, there was something that was also a bit missing, but if, if you're familiar with um, the, the way that information flows in the brain, basically there's something called microtubules, which are the tiny little tubes that carry single photons of light. Within that light is basically you, the information that makes up your, your character, your personality, all of that is basically just light, you know, you're, you're flowing being of light within that brain structure. Each photon is a, basically like a package of information about you, what you're thinking, what you're doing. You know, when they monitor the brain, you're thinking you know, there's these electrical storms of activity, which kind of sort of see things like what the belief you know, so they, they demonstrate in there. That, you know, basically your thinking is raging electrical storms within the brain and light being emitted. You are literally like being in that sense. But what is I, I found really interesting expanded on now is that not only are, are we this, this light, basically, but um, as the light photons move around, they interact with each other. So you have two photons will cause an interference pattern. Much the way that we talked before about this experiment, that the you know, light obviously interferes, that we have this effect within the brain. And then when this happens, you have the creation of these little, these little boxes of interference, which then allows us to be reactivated as holograms. I mean, that's the way holograms work. It's familiar with you create an interference pattern on a holographic plate, then you put the laser light back through it, and the original image comes back out of the plate, so the hologram is then emitted from the holographic plate. Uh, this is the same process that's going on in your brain. But you've got literally billions, not trillions of interference patterns in the brain. As light then passes back through that interference, it creates micro holograms within the brain. That is then projected outwards into your reality. So you are actually then projecting this holographic reality out. And none of this is sort of pie in the sky, you know, you, you, like I said, we're looking into all this yourselves, you don't know about it, so, yeah, it's, it's incredible, really. You know, we live in this sort of holographic reality, which is um, working on fractal principles. It, it's uh, one, of the, one of the additions to it recently that I, I got from this chap, Anthony Peake, which um, I haven't heard of, was that there's a number of sort of cutting edge researchers who say that, that the universe is permeated by tiny black holes, these miniature black holes. And obviously, this is speculative because uh, when they say black holes, are not a pretty say singularities or wormholes rather black holes. As I mentioned, black holes is a bit of a but so singularities or wormholes basically. No, no. Sorry, sorry. Um, but yeah, but these um that these apparently and obviously this is you know current research from some of the physicists that, that these these micro singularities exist throughout all of the universe. So of course they therefore exist within you, they exist within the brain, they exist within everything. Um, for us as as mass physical beings, our bodies, etc. This has no real effect. These are not 
large enough to have any tangible effect on your physical matter. I mean, they, they, they say they create a CERN and they can pop in and pop out of existence in the experiments of the, um, the super collider in CERN uh, without any tangible effect. However, that applies only to physical dense matter. Where they can have an effect is on consciousness, which is not physical matter. Physical matter you know, would be unable to pass through these similarities, they'd be destroyed or affected by them. So, but what could be happening is that your consciousness, your awareness, the light, you know, this, you know, this, this energetic part of us is able to pass through these singularities that exist everywhere and into alternate realities, into other dimensions. And that, you know, even as when you're dreaming, that you're actually slipping through singularities. Your consciousness is travelling into other realities, experiencing genuine realities. Uh, you know, for those people who have lucid dreaming, they, they probably know you'll find it much easier to accept that because I mean, uh, I've had a few experiences of lucid dream myself, I'm sure people here have, but you, you basically become aware that you are dreaming within the dream. And at that point, you can then create your own realities, or you can interact with people. And there is a phenomenon known within this that some of those people are actually other people dreaming. And there's people who have, who have met within the dreamscape, they, who know each other, you know, they have conversation, real conversation, verified later, that you are entering into genuine worlds with genuine other consciousnesses involved. Although some of the beings within that can be just creations of your own, because this is a very plastic space. Um, other people have experiences where they go through to realities which are very similar to our own, and they gain information which is useful in their day-to-day -day lives. So you might find that you would, for example, a personal experience I've had, I've woken up, you know, a kind of out-of-body experience, I've sat up, out of my body, not knowing I sat out of my body, just what I was in my, my room in London at the time, sat up, you know, and the room looked the, the same, basically. It looked like I was in my flat, you know. So first glance, I thought, well, I'm in my flat, aren't I? So, but there was, there was anomalies about it. There was the, outside the window, the light was sort of grey, you know, really, it was during night time, during dark. There was this sort of music playing somewhere in the background. There was a discarnate voice speaking somewhere in the other room in what sounded like Italian, mumbling something. Um, so there, there was anomalies, but where, where I couldn't quite, really, I knew that something wasn't right. But because you're in an awkward state yourself, you don't quite grasp on. It seems normal in that state that these anomalies are there. There's just a little itching bit in your mind saying, this looks not right. Yeah, this, yeah, this looks like my flat. It's not the same. In these kind of states, you can find out things from the people you meet there or objects you see, which you then bring back to this reality, which are useful. Because if, say, you are in a reality which is running slightly ahead of this one, and it's very similar, you can pull for information about things that are going to happen. Because they may not happen exactly the same, but there are realities that are believed to be very, very similar to ours, that you can literally just be changed by uh, you know, one difference within them. So the information there is tangible, that you can bring it back, and you apply it to your own life, and use it to your advantage. And so this seems to be quite possibly what is happening to us in our dream space. Also, people who use uh, meditation altered states, who find themselves going through to, say, alien landscapes, uh, also with the DMT I mentioned earlier, and obviously other sort of hallucinogens, you know, there's a whole list of epigens that have been used by shamans traditionally, that you know, again, to transfer you into an altered state where you are visiting other realities. I mean, um, you know, I've had experiences personally where you know, I've been to at least one reality which was complete fractal nature, you know, there was, there was no physical universe at all, you know, floating through fractal space, colours, energy, you know, there was a different feeling which doesn't exist in this reality, as far as I'm concerned, which was what I had to refer to only as like a chaos joy, which is where you are, you're literally overloaded with so much vibration, so much energy, so much that um, you, you, you just can't, you can't think in the way that we think, where you start a linear thought process. You're so overloaded that the only thing that can remain is a state of joy, because if you're not thinking, you're not worrying, if you're not worrying, you're naturally happy, because that is your fundamental state if you're not thinking, which is why most people find in meditation, where they quiet the mind, typically joy arises. So you know, these realities have tangible effects, you know, so even for like something, you know, to experience the emotion or a feeling that I've never experienced in this world, some say, well, oh, it's just the drugs, mate. Well, it's, well, you know, how did the drugs create a whole new human feeling? Seems a bit unlikely. Um, so I think you know these these sort of experiments are showing that we are entering into a uh, sorry that basically uh, there are these tangible realities and these and the biological sort of research the physics research 
is kind of backing that up. Uh, just basically, uh, there's another quick, I won't go through this, so I think again, people are familiar with this side, the law of attraction. I've got this silly picture there, because most people think the law of attraction to do with bringing money to, to themselves, which is the classic thing that we've seen through things like The Secret, which is um, see quite a well-known film now. The idea that you know, if you set your mind to a particular intention, positive intention, that you can bring things to you. The one that sounds best is the idea of attracting money, but there's, you know, the, the principle is that if you think about uh, something that you desire, whether it's happiness, you know, relationship success or business success, whatever it is, if you can set your mind to it in such a way as you believe it will happen, you believe it's real, and that you can then feel that it's real, it's really happening, uh, that you eventually you you naturally attract this out of this fractal holographic reality because because it's such a plastic reality and it's infinite and infinite potential, infinite energy, there's no real reason that we can put any limits on it, that we can say, oh, well, it's impossible that such and such would happen, you know, it's impossible that would happen. You know, it, it, we just can't say that anything's impossible anymore, looking at some of the things that, you know, even we've touched on today, and, you know, there are other guys, I'm sure other guys, girls, you know, two talks up here, I've said to you other stuff that gives you the idea that, you know, reality is not fixed, you know, it's a very strange reality. The law of attraction, if applied properly, can help you to manifest, you know, happiness in your life. It doesn't have to be to do with money. I say, you know, basically the principle is that, you know, what we think about, we all become. And so if you were, basically if you were thinking selfish thoughts, eventually you will start to become a more selfish person. You will start to feel that. It becomes a, a feeling within you. And once you feel like a selfish person, you start to actually attract that experience in your reality, which will be that the relationships around you will start to break down because you will become a very self oriented person where your world and reality just becomes about you, and in the end it just is you, because everyone else is gone. So the, the, that, that's how obviously the reverse of the law of attraction works. I'm sure, we, I'm sure we, we've known people where, you know, you've seen that happen, and eventually they repel people because they've gone, gone the wrong way with it. Um, but then, yeah, the, the flip side is you can actually bring good stuff to you by constantly monitoring your own feelings. So if you feel negative, if you feel depressed, if you feel down, whatever it is, Catch that, say, hang on, if I'm feeling like that, that must have been a flow of thought that led to that. Even if I wasn't aware of it, I must have been thinking negative thoughts to get a negative feeling. Like you, you nip in the blood there, you know, raise your vibration, whatever it is you use, I don't know if meditation, whether you've got a picture of the kids that makes you happy, but something that pulls you back from that and recognise that you need to then think some positive thoughts or do some positive actions. And that's essentially the best way just to monitor it. Obviously, law of attraction is a big subject in itself, so I, I'm only touching on the surface, but again, it's one of those things that you're, you're a bit, maybe being a bit dismissive of because of the way it's being portrayed with this, um, specifically for money, uh, just to revisit it because, you know, it, it can be used for much more, you know, spiritually developing type activities and also just generally bringing increased happiness into your life. So, I recommend it. So. So I'm working with myself, by no means am I an absolute expert with it, but um, yeah, it's something I've been able to my practices. Uh, just the last one, I have a bit of comment, but yeah, being the change, becoming a Jedi Knight. Uh, I think everyone would like to be Jedi Knight. <laughs> I don't know, like, I'd say you'd like to be a Jedi Knight, not everyone else, but basically, um, I know the field is a bit tongue in cheek, but you know, I think George Lee, because you know, he was aware of these types of you know, subjects, uh, the psychic phenomena, the way that reality is a plastic. Uh, also, I mean, if you remember this, this classic scene here where basically Luke is fighting Darth Vader in the cave and actually, you know, the reality is it turns out that when he, when he defeats him, that he's actually himself behind the mask. Uh, and this is this idea, you know, what we actually fight against, you know, it's sometimes what we're actually fighting is more than we fight ourselves. You know, there's an inter the internal war, uh, the, the, the dark versus the light. And again, you know, this thing crops up again later when he actually does fight Darth Vader, you know, his father, and says, you know, strike me down, come to the dark side, because basically what you fight against, you become. These all ideas, again, from sort of the law of attraction. And whatnot. So, I mean, George Lucas was, you know, he's a very clued up guy, you know, I think most people suspect that in Hollywood, you know, there's a lot of elites swapping about, chatting about some pretty, pretty intense stuff. And then, you know, by no means did all these guys get their power and money without knowing some of these secrets and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, he, he was basically giving us a bit of a nod that. You know, this is the way it works. If you want to go into a battle against the Illuminati, all angry and all the rest of it, then all you're going to do is create a new alarm with the Illuminati with you in it. So you're very aware of that. I know that's a problem that 
uh, everyone who's trying to turn the direction of rallies around from this sort of new world order has to be aware of. We have to sort of do it with applied anger, with love involved in it. That, you know, yeah, you can focus your anger in a way and use your activities. Anger can be transmuted to useful energy, but you should not let it get to the point of hatred and wanting to destroy your enemy and crush your enemy. Because once you're a person who loves to destroy and crush people, that sounds awfully like the new world order to me. So, so you do have to monitor that. And that's, this is kind of a, a heads up to people about that. Also, of course, this whole idea of the force, again, that there's this singular energy throughout the universe that we can tap into, and we can utilize. I mean, it's exactly what we discussed here, that you know, that's what we actually have found in physics, is right, that there is this, this whole, whole sort of system of energy that interweaves throughout our reality, for which we can tap into, which can be used to help uh, manifest things, or to, to bring about uh, peculiar events. I mean, the 64 arts, basically, is uh, so a reference again to sort of ancient uh, sort of traditions. I mean, I don't know if there's specifically 64 different um, psychic abilities. Certainly, there's a large number of strange phenomena. There's a lot of psychic abilities, a lot of supernormal events. Um, personally, I, you know, I've had a number of them. I'm sure most people here have had at least some personal experiences that they would say were peculiar, whether it's synchronicities or whether it's you know, a dream that came true some sort of flash of telepathy, you know, or you know, sensing a family member that wasn't well, and then they, you know, call them they're not well. Um, I, I believe, you know, through applied sort of meditation techniques and um, through your own, you know, whatever, whatever works for you, basically, it might be you do yoga, yoga, or just positive thinking, that you can essentially unlock a number of these gifts. I mean. I suppose I've been a bit fortunate, like that for whatever reason, uh, I had never spontaneous since happened. I, you know, from my own sort of awakening, which was going back to, uh, well, essentially before, before having a real profound awakening, when I was like 15, I was having spontaneous telepathy events starting happening in my own life. Uh, I remember particularly the, the first time it ever happened, I was just stood out of my house and I had a peculiar feeling that um, something was wrong, didn't know what it was, or you know, it didn't make any sense, everything seemed fine, sunny days, all that, no reason to be concerned. And then suddenly I thought, hang on a minute, my brother's in the police station, he's under arrest. You know, it's, you know, I, just, I just knew him, I just knew he's, he's under arrest in the police station. Then later on that day he got caught, he'd been arrested at a rally, and he was in the police station somewhere. That was the first time I've had spontaneous telepathy. But I mean, um, so after that, it, you know, it carried on, developed, and I had all sorts of weird things like that go on. But uh, my, my awakening experience back in about 2001, um, from that, that's when I basically I got this sense that you know something was wrong with reality, something wrong with my life. I had uh, a good job, a good job. I worked in a bank. I worked for a criminal organisation. Um, but you know, <laughs> ironic. You know, I thought I was a pet, I thought I was a petty criminal when I was a teenager because I was on you know, doing drugs and all the rest of hanging out with people who were in the wrong element. But you know, but then you work at a respectable bank, you know, and uh, you steal millions and millions of pounds of people. You know, throws the most freezing erratic accounts whilst you fund the companies that bombing them and keep the money, you know. Yeah, you know, downstairs with the gamblers, high on cocaine. You know, uh, of course, you know, we're respectable, we got suits on. Um, so, you know, but, you know so that, if only enough at that point in my life, I guess that played into my waking, because obviously somewhere in my gut, you say, hey, it's not, things aren't the way you think they are, boy. You've got to wake up. Yeah, you've got, you've got a good job, you've got the, the nice girlfriend, you've got the flat, you're drinking champagne in the London bars, you know, but you don't feel happy, do you? There's something not right, and that—that's when it really started to click in that you know there was there was more. It was more to this reality. It's not just about he who has the most toys wins. That you know there there is something beyond that which is tangible, which will eventually come into your experience. I, I don't care who it is, even the New World Order, whoever. At some point, they get that feeling in their gut. It ain't right. What you what you're doing ain't right, or where you are ain't right. Unless you're already doing that effort. Uh, and that's, that's what's happened for me. I mean, I had that, and then from there, various other experiences came about, such as, you know, I put a few on there, but like, uh, obviously, the telepathy, astral travel, uh, lucid dreaming, psychometry, which is like reading an object, something else is held, and sort of telling about what, the, what they, you know, about their personality. Mediumship, <laughs> the, you know, getting messages from the deceased to pass on to the living, um, channeling, which is, past, again, similar, but getting information from long -term. Beings and want to convey information, um, healing, so the Reiki and crystal healing and stuff like that. Um, 
remote viewing and um, also experiencing all the states of dimensions. You know, some of those from using ethical gems, some from sort of spontaneous or dream, dream states, which have taken me into those kinds of um, experiences. So, I, mean, I have my personal convictions. I cannot transfer them to anyone else. Uh, all I can say is that, you know, um, keep an open mind on them. If you haven't had an experience like that, just keep an open mind. I, mean, I, I often find as well that reading a, a book can be like a portal to these experiences. If you read a book, like I, I read Castaneda's Art of Dreaming, and um, after reading that, and like looking at these techniques of doing these lucid dreaming, you know, I had a lucid dream, you know, I mean, said, you know, go into the dream, you know, before you sleep, look at your hands and say, when I look at my hands in the dream, I will wake up and know it's a dream. And I did that in words, you know, so, so although I, you know, you can't transfer experiences, I do sometimes find the books are good in that they open your mind to possibilities, and that then you may have those things happen to you. So, so you know, you don't need to just take things on faith. There are ways of kind of getting your own direct experiences. And obviously, you know, you go to see readers if you want to see whether telepathy is real or mediumship. You know, there's people out there that can give you more direct experiences. Um, some of them, you know, some of them obviously more life-changing than others, some just sort of peculiar. Um, so I mean, my, one of my most weird ones, which is why I do this, why, you know, why I'm involved in 2012 and whatnot, was I had an experience back in like, 2002, where um, basically I was just on a, a website called, Half, it was Half Money Code Spiritual Centre's website, so a place in Wales, which I assume they still exist, um, talking to um, just a lady I met through this website, and all of a sudden, instead of being in the chat room, we found ourselves, like I said, we were in two different locations, I don't know where she lives, but uh, we both found ourselves suddenly floating over a jungle, basically, and ahead of us was this white stepped pyramid. And as we got sort of closer and closer, it was apparently it was one of these Mayan pyramids. And she got the feeling of the year 675 AD, you know, I you know, precision of that. Uh, we noticed there was a chap on top of this pyramid, it looked like some sort of shamanic type chap, you know, he had a staff, he was doing something, I don't know what he was doing. I had the sense that there was a hidden tunnel in the top of the pyramid that we couldn't see, but we went down inside it. Uh, there was, you know, it was, it was like being there. I mean, it's not like, you know, you have a vision where you're dreaming or something. It was, it was like suddenly you were in a helicopter flying over the jungle, flying towards the Mayan pyramid. You know, so this was really, really full on bizarre. Uh, what she got at the end of this was that the experience was for me, not so much for her. Which, um, you know, I don't know why at the time I you know, no particular interest in. Mayans or anything, you know, interested in weird stuff, yeah, sure. Um, but, you know, that obviously was playing out. Obviously, it is, it was meant to be something that I was supposed to take seriously, and I've ended up, you know, drawn into this whole subject of Maya 2012. So, these kind of, you know, strange experiences, they do guide us, they do have meaning. So, I mean, I'd say if you have any, you know, any of them, just take note of them and just you'll be open to more. Um, so, um, I will pretty much end it there. I was going to sort of go a bit into the Rainbow Warriors prophecy, but what I say is um, if anyone's interested and not heard of that, to perhaps just go online and Google that, because I mean, that's a prophecy which I personally believe that you know, people like us here are all part of this idea that there would come a generation of people um, who would essentially start waking up to the fact that our world is being you know, absolutely crapped on, and that they would wake up and start to turn the tide against the demons that are running a market. You know, Hacking the earth to bits and you know, could drink up all the oil. Um, so, if you haven't heard that, I'll just say, like, Google, now, I was going to buy an idea, but I wanted to do a review experiment. So, uh, basically, I was on draw these clothes there and say, I'll Google that, because I think you might find that prophecy interesting for anyone who's interested in these kind of subjects. Because uh, I'd say that, you know, with hope of saying, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And, you know, basically, as the Creed would say, yeah, we are the Rainbow Warriors. So, you know, it's uh, all up to us now where things go. What?